Okay, there we go. All right. So again, I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar. It's a joint intelligence GTAC event about new trends affecting the future of enterprise contact centers. And my name is Mike Aoki. I'll be the moderator for today's session. And what I want to do is welcome everybody uh, from both Canada and the U.S. and around the world as well to today's session. And the agenda we'll cover off is just a brief, brief welcome. And we'll talk about some of the biggest challenges that enterprise contact centers will face in the second half of this year, 2019, and beyond as well. And also have a moment as well for a question and answer period. And so for those of you at your offices, what you can do is actually type in any kinds of questions or messages that you have. There's both a chat window as well as a question and answer window located just near the bottom of the actual screen itself. And so you'll be able to actually type in your questions. We'll take a look at those and be able to answer some of them at the end of the program as well. And again, thank you very much for tuning in. And I'm Mike Aoki, the moderator for today's session. And we'll also take a look right now at the uh, panel members that we're going to have actually sharing their expertise with us. And so first, I want to welcome Martin Tracy. And Martin is the CEO of Intelligence, which is a San Diego-based uh, company that also has a branch office in Oakville, Ontario, just west of Toronto. Uh, so both Canada and the U.S. presence, helping contact centers in terms of enterprise uh, solutions. Also, Jeremy Watkin, who is the Director of Customer Experience at FCR, which is a, a Eugene, Oregon-based uh, third-party contact center, one of the premier contact centers out there providing services. And I'd also like to welcome uh, a well, very close neighbor, fellow Toronto person of mine, Vafa Akhaven, who's the President and CEO of Newbridge, which is an excellent uh, consulting company that comes to contact center processes and solutions as well. And my name is Mike Aoki. I'm the President of Reflective Keynote, the Toronto-based training company for contact centers, and also a member of GTAC, the Greater Toronto Area Contact Center Association's Board of Directors. Now, the first question we'll talk about is really focused in terms of what is the biggest challenge that enterprise contact centers will face in the second half of this year? And at this point, I want to turn things over to Marty to talk a bit about that. And then we'll later hear from Jeremy and also from Bath as well. But Marty, over to you. Thanks, Mo. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can. Great. Um, that's a bit of a trick question because in itself, uh, the contact center in a short time frame never has just one large challenge. Uh, there's far too many really to kind of single it down by itself. Um, but there are several large challenges that are coming from the rapid changes in technology in the market and creating contact centers and their management with a lot of different, uh, you know, troubling tasks to tackle. Um, you know, to really call out one as the most important factor is a little bit challenging um, because it also, every contact center is different based on their size, their priorities, their market, their challenges are going to be different. But with that said, I think the one challenge we see that really faces every contact center across the entire spectrum is that very soon, you know, they're going to have to face the decision of moving to a cloud-based contact center solution. And that's a, a challenge they really don't have control over. You know, unless they've already begun a digital transformation that includes contact center as a service, they'll be faced with a premise-based solution that's getting a slower and smaller evolutionary set of changes. You know, very few prem-based solutions have long-term roadmaps. The real innovation is in the cloud. So this is a challenge that every contact center is going to face. And it's happening very rapidly on the small scale size contact centers. Uh, the larger contact centers still have a few good choices where there's a lot of innovation and direction. Um, there's a lot of you know, application development. So uh, you know, the positive side to this change is that Contact centers as service solutions bring what were considered often some of the higher end feature sets and applications to the smaller contact center world. So it gives a lot of choice and gives a lot of smaller contact centers access to features and applications that used to sit in kind of the large contact center world. Um, the other nice piece of contact centers as service solutions is they're constantly upgraded. So you're eliminating probably the biggest hassle in the contact center world, which was the upgrade. You know, upgrades in the contact center world are always super challenging you know, because it's such an always evolving, ever present requirement in, in, in a daily business operation. So there's a very positive aspect to that. Um, so, you know, the evolution of the contact center to the cloud, I think, is the biggest challenge on the roadmap of contact center management and, you know, the biggest thing that they can't actually control. We're headed in a direction where, you know, the development in this industry is based on cloud-based solutions. 
Okay, great. Martin, that's a really great point as well, but the whole cloud-based trend that's going on. And also let's hear from Jeremy as well to go and talk a bit about what his perspective is in terms of uh, looking at this question. So Jeremy, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Um, so I, I wouldn't say this is necessarily a new challenge, but I, it's definitely something that I see increasing in importance. And I think it's just going to continue, but it's around mm -hmm. the customer experience and listening to the voice of the customer. Uh, and just to quickly define what that is, it's really the, uh, the insights that we're gaining from what our customers are saying about our company, our brand, our product, our service, you know, the service our agents are actually providing, our policies, and what customers are saying, both good and bad. Uh, and, and I think one thing that's important, and I don't think this is rocket science, but contact centers are actually listening to the voice of the customer all day, every day. Our frontline agents, whether you, they're using chat, phone, email, social media, text messaging, all these new emerging channels, they're hearing from the customer all day long. Um, and then add on to that, our leaders in our contact centers uh, are hearing from customers through our quality assurance processes. Um, they may have really fancy speech and text analytics tools, sentiment analysis, uh, feedback surveys, all of these things are data points uh, where we can hear from the voice of the customer. Uh, and the big question is, what are we doing with that information? Do we have, uh, you know, our, is our, let me just take quality assurance, for example. Is that just a process where we're checking boxes? Or are we using it to gather customer feedback and add value to the rest of our organization? And I can definitely tell you that uh, with clients that I work with, uh, they are desperate uh, to hear from the contact center on what the big drivers are, what the big issues are that, that customers are encountering. Um, and, you know, we have tons of, tons of metrics within our, within our contact centers, but uh, ultimately, do we understand the key issues that are happening? Are we able to couple those with um, data to make these actionable insights to help improve things like customer satisfaction or net promoter score or uh, reduce churn? Um, so we want to be a, be a good partner within our organizations to the rest of our organization to help them achieve business goals. And it really starts with listening to the voice of the customer. And I think another big challenge around this within our contact centers is to think about how do we scale good practices when we have customer feedback uh, to close the loop with them consistently, especially if a customer is dissatisfied. Uh, how do we offer appeasements to customers that make sense without giving away the farm? Uh, and our ultimate goal, uh, you know, isn't completing that quality form or whatever, but but making sure that we're consistently delivering better service to our customers in a way that helps our business achieve its its goals. Okay, great, Jeremy. It's a really great point about the whole quality assurance both with the customer process going <laughs> forward. And now, Vaf, we'll turn things over to you in terms of your opinion about what is one of the biggest challenges for the second half of the, uh, of the year. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, what's, what's really interesting for me is uh, kind of looking at where we are today compared to 15 years ago when I was at JD Power, I, I ran the global consulting business at JD Power and, and uh, designed and built the call center program there and the certification program and so on. And what's interesting is that the same kind of fundamental issues that we're talking about today, we were talking about 15 years ago. So the, the question for me is, you know, how much have we really advanced? Uh, because if the same issues keep coming up, then we really haven't resolve them, um, I don't think. But, and, and the points that Marty and, and uh, Jeremy make are really critical points, that these are ongoing. So they, they're not really resolved in a particular time and space. Rather, they're evolving over time because of external conditions and, and demographics and customers and so on. That comes to my point very specifically about the question that you're asking, which is what's important in the second half uh, of the year? And I think with everything that's going on, with all of the technology trends and, and um, uh, the, the changes of, uh, amongst customers, consumers, and business models, the biggest challenge at the back end of this year is going to be the planning for the following. I think that's, the, that that's going to be the biggest challenge, as opposed to 
you know, the same thing in a different way or um, something new in the same way. It's really understanding what are go what's going on and being able to plan for 2019. And this is all about transition and transformation. Um, one of my colleagues when I was at McGraw-Hill, uh, Tom Hendricks was a four-time shuttle commander. And he used to talk about change um, as uh, you know, a pilot of uh, the shuttle. He said, you know, changing large organizations is like changing the engine on the shuttle as I'm flying into space. It's a very complicated thing. Um, and I think that's going to be the biggest challenge. The demographics are changing. Technology is changing. Data analytics is changing. Artificial intelligence is coming into play. So for the folks that are on the call, their colleagues and their leaders, the back end of this uh, 2018, uh, there's got to be considerable uh, foresight exercise and discernment exercise in planning uh, for 2019. The technologies and, and what we do with F, you know, first call resolution and integration of customer intelligence, actionable intelligence, etc. those are, are continuing to be done and we'll pay attention to them. And those are very important points that Marty and Jeremy made. That the only thing I can add is this challenge of planning for 2019. Okay, great. Thanks, Safa. That's excellent. So planning for 2019, Jeremy, we were talking about a lot of voice of the customer and quality assurance, and Marty as well about, you know, the importance of cloud contact center, and how it'll impact big enterprise, you know, solutions as well as smaller centers as well. So just some great points we're looking at uh, next year, or this year, so the second half of this year. The next question is, what are some of the biggest technological trends for enterprise contact centers in 2019? So now going beyond the next six months and looking at next year, you know, what's going to happen? So uh, really looking ahead for that. And we'll actually turn to uh, Jeremy in a moment just to go and want to share with us a bit more in terms of your opinion about that. So Jeremy, over to you. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, I want to zero in on AI machine learning because uh, it's all the rage right now. Uh, it, you know, you can, I think weekly I receive some sort of newsletter that talks about chatbots. And certainly we've seen, I don't know how many people on this call have ordered a pizza through a chatbot a myriad of other things uh, that you can do now without speaking with an agent. Um, and, and furthermore, I've, I've talked with many chatbot vendors that, that tell me if you're not, you know, if you're not building a bot for your, your customers to interact with, then you're, you're behind that you're a, you need to get on that train right away. And I think some of these do make sense at the right scale. Uh, but I want, I want to talk about a couple less sexy, but I think bigger trends within AI that I'm seeing for the contact center. And it's really around tools uh, for self-help content to get that in front of your customers and also tools that can augment agent performance to help them become more consistent and more efficient. So a couple things. First, on the, on the self-help side of things, uh, you know, I've seen tools now where customers can, uh, when they're entering their question on a web form or, or entering a chat request, uh, that they're actually presented with self-help options to try and self-solve the issue before they uh, before routing to an agent. Uh, and and it's similar to a, a bot, but a little bit more versatile because the bot is actually taking the time to understand what the customer typed in and try and present them with a reasonable solution. You know, you want to be careful with this uh, to make sure that you don't aggravate customers when they really do want to contact support, but, uh, but this can definitely reduce your contacts. And it can also, uh, it, it can potentially, it, you know, if you reduce contact volume, it can uh, potentially reduce headcount, but it also creates opportunities within contact centers where agents can help keep knowledge base and self-help content up to date and just deliver an overall better experience for the customer. Because um, there is research out there where customers don't want to, con many customers don't want to contact customer service if they don't have to. So we need to be thinking about that in the contact center. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk about was just agent performance. Um, and now, you know, imagine uh, AI reading what the customer wrote in or, or listening to what they said on the phone and actually suggesting responses to your agents. Uh, and I think that's what I've been looking at a lot lately is take chat support, for example, uh, where, where an AI can suggest to your agents, maybe 
three to five responses that have worked in past in past questions uh, of a similar nature and the agent ultimately still um, still presses the send button on that response and can certainly add personalization in there but it can it can help them become a whole lot more efficient we see that on email where where uh, where an AI can understand what was said in the email and suggest a macro or a canned response for an agent to use. Uh, so imagine if you can, you you know, you can work toward doubling the amount of of chats an agent can handle. Maybe not all at once, but they get more efficient, so they can they can handle more per hour. And then you see other benefits like improved training time uh, and and just just overall freeing up your agents to. Uh, to make better, more human connections with customers and worry less about searching through tools to find the right answers and resources. Uh, so, so I think uh, if you're if you're going down the the AI route, which I think a lot of people are considering it right now, um, think about some of the less sexy the back end tools that can help you become more efficient, help your your customers self serve a little bit better. Okay, great, Jeremy. Thanks. It's Mike again, and thank you for that. That's actually a really good point about AI and how useful it can be just on the agent side of things, performance side of things. It's a great point about that. And Beth, we'll turn things over to you in terms of your opinion for the biggest uh, challenges for next year. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think, uh, you know, wh where I want to start is the context for the technology, because I think that's very important. Um, you know, so, if, for example, you look at what drives you know, a customer's experience, you can, from one perspective, boil it down to speed, effort, and cost, right? And there's there's a balance between these three that has to be maintained. If the effort's too much, but the speed is really fast, I could still be satisfied or, or vice versa. So it's really important to understand the content. So speed, effort, and cost, whatever we're trying to accomplish as we're going through these periods of transition and digital uh, transformation, we have to make sure we're we have this context at the forefront that we continue to link back to, well, is this going to make it easy, less effort for the customer? Is it going to be faster for the customer? And then the other part of the context is you know, this consistency of uh, excellence across channels, uh, across touch points, across the value stream. So why is it that you know, if, if my experience at, at the retail environment or through a bot or on chat is different than when I'm on the phone? I want that consistency, and therefore, what are the, uh, the the technology trends that will support that consistency of experience? What are the technology trends that will deliver on speed and effort? Um, I think systems integration is going to be a big uh, issue. We have we still have in contact centers multiple sources of information. Some contact centers actually don't have all of the sources of information that they need. They're either sitting in operations or field services or over in marketing and we're not sharing and they're not integrated. So, um, you know, still agents today that are serving me as the customer don't have access to everything that they need to have access to. They still have to have, uh, they have to go into two, sometimes three different platforms to be able to solve my problem. Um, the customer thinks the agent doesn't know what they're doing. In fact, the agent is highly proficient in what they're doing, but because it takes time and because there might be some dead air time, the customer may think that this agent doesn't know what they're doing. And so the results come back through the voice of the customer that the agent doesn't know what they're doing and we may put together the right kind of solution. So it has implications. But system integration is going to be very important in terms of oper operational, transactional, perception data for all of that to come together so that the uh, leadership, the management, and the frontline uh, can make sure they're making the right kind of decisions for the customer. Uh, platforms are going to be, uh, become very important for all of this to get kind of what we call put it through the sausage factory and out comes something that's usable for me as an agent or as a manager in the first five minutes of my on the job, I open up my uh, computer, I turn on my terminal, and I know exactly what are the things that I need to focus on. Uh, a company like Amparity is doing some really interesting work in kind of integrating all of these data points um, to help the customer. And I think to Jeremy's point, artificial intelligence is obviously going to have a huge impact, but I think that that's a long way off yet. Um, you know, there, uh, our experiences, there's more noise and rhetoric about artificial intelligence than actual intelligence about artificial intelligence. 
Um, the fact is that when I call uh, my credit card company today and there is a voice on the other side interacting with me, which is their version, and this is one of the primary Canadian banks, and it, it's, it's supposed to be AI, but it doesn't recognize what I'm saying and it actually goes into the wrong area of the bank to get a response and then that makes it more frustrating. So you've got to be careful with, uh, and very particular, uh, with artificial intelligence and how you map its uh, integration into your systems and into your processes because ultimately you need to have it be a customer-centric design. And if it's not a customer-centric design and if you're, if you're implementing AI because it's sexy, because everybody is talking about it, because the CEO or the CFO said, yeah, I was at this conference and you know, we've got to use AI and let's find a way to use it. And then suddenly an army in the organization is running around trying to figure it out. Um, those are all signs of uh, a design and integration that's uh, going to be very challenging. Okay, great, Bob. That's a really good point about looking at systems integration and the whole idea about having everything work together. That's a big key as well. And Marty, what are your what's your thoughts in terms of looking at uh, some of the big challenges technologically for next year? Well, when it comes to what the big technology trends are, they're driven by the customer. You know, what are the customers' prospects, partners that organizations have? What are their needs and desires? And as demographics of customers are changing, so does the way they desire to interact. You know, Jeremy talked about customers desiring to self-serve, to, to solve problems. I often wonder if their desire to do that has not been driven by a lifetime of poor customer service experiences. You know, do you, there are websites or companies where I will self-serve, even though it's not generally my first option, just because the other side has always been a poor experience. So, you know, both Vafa and Jeremy have kind of noted, you know, performance of these technologies is going to come down to execution and plan. So, you know, but when it comes to the technologies themselves, I'm in the same boat as Jeremy, but maybe a little more expanded from the standpoint of self-service is key. You know, self-service not only will make customers happy, but can create incredible efficiencies for your organization. But AI and automation are a very big part of it. And one of the great things about these technologies is by embracing them and utilizing them, you're creating efficiencies within your organization. The part that's most important to me is you're meeting a customer desire. You're helping them solve things the way they want. You're freeing up agents for more important escalations. And the other things I love about tools like chatbots and chat from the website is when you think about purchasing decisions, customer service decisions today, you know, so the large, large percent start with an online experience. And when I think of customers that hit websites of customers we deal with and go away, it keeps me up. And I, they've had a bad immediate experience. So by tying the contact center in to these experiences and using the chatbot technologies to escalate these engagements to a voice or a video, you know, interaction with an agent, we're really creating a great ability or dynamic for these organizations to engage at a higher level, hold on to those engagements, solve problems. So, you know, when you think of the online experience, that's where these technologies naturally drive efficiencies and create all kinds of opportunities for the contact center. You know, I often think of when somebody hits a website and they can't find something and they move on or they hit a website and they're not 100% sure if it's the right part or the right product, the ability for the contact center to grab that engagement, escalate it to a conversation with an expert who can resolve that issue quickly. And a big thing that people don't talk about a lot or recognize in that is human interaction. One of the beautiful things of human interaction is the time it can save. Right? Human interaction at an expert level can save a tremendous amount of time, whether you're a CEO, a consultant, a consumer. And if you can create that experience within your contact center where somebody who's frustrated on a website can immediately get the right answers, you've created a great customer service experience. You've also created enormous savings because most companies don't spend enough time looking at 
the cost of somebody ordered the wrong part. It was a bad experience. I'm not buying from them again. Somebody ordered the wrong part, the cost of getting it shipped back, getting the new one out, the time loss, right? These tools really allow you to address great efficiencies, give customers what they want, and then on the back end, start to really control your engagements. You know, the other piece I love about it is it's a great story for a contact center director or manager to share with the C-level executives about the impact they are having. And so, you know, these tools, you have to be very careful, like Bob, plan together, but they can have a tremendous value within your organization. So, you know, it's the self-service tools that are really making the difference. And I think it also changes the dynamic within your organization at an agent level, allowing agents to work on higher value, you know, interactions. So that's what I'm seeing, Mike. Okay, great. Thanks, Marty. I appreciate that as well. And some great comments in terms of looking at next year's challenges about systems integration, as Vafa mentioned, and looking at, you know, the whole idea about AI and how it can impact things, not just for the customers, but also supporting the agents as well with better answers and suggestive information. And Marty, to your point about the whole idea about being able to offer really great self-service to customers, so that they're able to, you know, solve their own issues and, and also about just cutting out that back-end waste in terms of incorrect deliveries and wrong orders and things like that as well. So again, some really key things to look for for next year. And now the next question and last question we'll ask about is, how can leaders prepare their enterprise contact centers to cope with all of these challenges? There's a number of them coming up now. And again, you, all, you know, all three of you have actually outlined some of the challenges for next year. So how can leaders really prepare their enterprise contact centers to cope with these challenges? And Vaf, will turn things over to, to you to go and answer that question. Sure. And to go um, first. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I think, I'm, I'm, I don't believe that the fundamental issue is uh, one of technology. Um, I think at the core, it's uh, one of human capital management. I mean, if you look, if you really look at it, when organizations say human, you know, human resources are the, are the greatest assets that we have, even though they don't necessarily live that, that that's a different conversation. Um, the most common denominator in all organizations, actually in everything, is, is the person, is the human being, right? Uh, it, it's the person that's making decisions. It's the person that's designing the processes. It's the person that designs the machine that designs the process. It's the person that uh, writes the algorithm that does artificial intelligence. So at the core is the person. So how we manage the person, uh, that whole uh, exercise of cap, uh, human capital management, from our perspective is the, the cardinal uh, principle in uh, any organization, and particularly in the contact center environment where there's so much change happening so quickly. So uh, that has to be a very important, if you want to prepare your contact centers and your, your enterprise contact centers, you really need to focus on your people and give, helping them build the capacity to make the right kinds of decisions, to, to gain the right kind of insights, and to, to design the right kind of processes, and to select the right uh, technology for their business. So, so it's about human capital management and capacity building. And I think the second thing leaders can do is focus on customer centric design, really understand what it is to be customer centric, to put the customer at the center of everything and have that become the key driver. Uh, what do they expect? Uh, you know, I want to be able to solve my problem anytime, anywhere, through any channel. And so how can we create that? I want it to be effortless. I want it to be quick. You know, I, I know uh, by virtue of interacting with a lot of contact centers historically as a customer and looking at data, uh, I've now learned what things uh, actually I can do quicker by contacting the contact center or going on YouTube or doing a Google search. I don't even bother with them. So really have a customer-centric design approach. Um, I think leaders themselves need to rethink what their roles and responsibilities are. They need to become facilitators as opposed to directors. What I mean by that is, you, know, you as leaders, uh, you, you need to create the environment and the space where great things can emerge and then make sure that you're getting the right talent in there and then facilitating that. So it's almost like creating a championship team. You know, you don't necessarily get the best person you don't, for every position. You don't necessarily get... Uh, you know, the, the, the right tools. It's the combination of all those things. And the general manager or the coach is responsible to create the environment where those things can happen. Definitely recommend that you establish an innovation hub 
um, that has resources and authority. You need to create a cross-functional team, uh, leverage diversity, um, you know, rotate these resources uh, through that innovation hub so that it becomes part of your uh, capacity building uh, within the organization and create a place for them where they can test things and pilot things and beta things and, and be able to influence um, the rest of the organization. And I think leaders need to make a clear distinction between working in the business as opposed to working on the business. Um, and if you're, because there's so much pressure today to work in the business. Um, and you've got to be careful that you as a, as a leader uh, don't have everybody working in the business, that there's a certain portion of the organization that needs to work on the business, on the strategy, on the innovation hub, human capital management, et cetera. So those are the four or five things I, I think um, leaders need to do uh, moving forward. Okay, great point, Vafa, as well. And I like your comments about investing in the human capacity and human capital and really being able to help integrate because you talk so much about technology, but it's also about the people side of the business as well and being able to work on that. And, and Marty, I'd love to hear from you in a moment just in terms of what you think in terms of what are some of the biggest things that we can look forward to as well. So Marty, I'll turn things over to you right now. Well, this is one of those questions that's fun to answer because you're the one who wants to execute it, right? You know, it's... Uh, it's very easy to tell people how to get things done, but to execute them is a very different story. But with that said, you know, the start answer is simple. Have a plan, right? This is about planning. I will focus a little bit more on the technology side when I talk about it, but do a real analysis of the maturity of your contact center today. Understand where it sits, where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are. Use that to look at your CX and process goals for the business and create a vision roadmap of where you want your contact center to be, what it should look like based on your business's operation, on your business's core values, on the way you engage with your customers. And then of course, factor into that a good understanding of what is your customer's journey look like today? Right? We have all these analytics, all these other pieces, but to give them what they want, you have to understand what they're seeing and what they don't like about it. So you're building this roadmap of assessing very critically, what do we do well today? Where is our market asking us to go and how can we do it? What does the journey look like? Once you've done all that, keep in mind while doing it and planning for the future, our goal is to move from reactive to proactive. To me, the ultimate goal for any contact center or any interaction from a CX perspective is to be proactive. There's nothing better for a customer when their needs are anticipated. Right? We see it at every level of service we engage in. So once you've really laid that roadmap out for yourself, then you have the opportunity to evaluate and look at the technologies that are out there today and decide what best fits are for you. One of the things that excites me about contact center technology today is the opportunity exists for contact centers to create an environment that fits what they want versus trying to use different, whatever they're presented from a technology perspective and fit with those applications and features that are available, right? So, you know, you can now choose your direction. Access to automation, self-serve, AI, and analytics will lead to improved customer performance and measurement. And as well, one of the great things about where we've reached technology-wise is with analytics, it's becoming easier to show your C-level executives where you're making a difference on a daily basis, right? Where the contact center has a big impact and really proving to them what most people in the contact center world have known for years, that the contact center is an absolute key differentiator for all organizations from a competitive perspective in their marketplaces. It's the face of most organizations and when you ask about any organization, most people are sharing their experience, how they feel about an organization is about their customer service. Right? There's a distinctive difference and it can have a big impact far beyond simple products. So I think you know, having a plan and understanding where you wanna go and then looking at the technologies that'll make that happen versus looking at technologies and trying to fit to them. That's the way we see it, Mike. Okay, great point. Great point, Marty, in terms of looking at the whole idea about you know, how that drives things. And again, looking at what you want to solve with technology versus trying to shoehorn technology in. And, and Jeremy, we'll turn things over to you as well. What are your thoughts as far as some of those challenges going forward? 
Yeah, I, there have been some great points here. I'm taking lots of notes. Um, but I, I think what I would say is we need to just continuously be improving. Um, our, our customers' preferences and needs are constantly changing. We've talked about uh, different technologies that are coming sooner or later, and those certainly impact customers. And uh, so we need, to, we need to make sure that we don't have our heads buried in the sand, that we are... We're um, we're testing out new things, trying new technologies. I love what Vafa said about the uh, the innovation hub, uh, and I really see I see a kind of a two sided approach to our customer experience. It's a a holistic view of it, uh, where we want to make sure uh, with the customer at the center of it that we're focused on both the customer experience and the agent experience, and realize that those two things just go hand in hand with each other. On the customer side, I already said it, uh, it's, it's essential that we constantly listen to the voice of the customer, understand their preferences, understand their pain points, um, work to improve self-help. Uh, we need to develop strategies constantly around that. And, and some of it, you know, some of it will be a little reactive because we'll be listening to them. But, but I think the more we get in that habit, we're, we're able to predict uh, what some of those customer pain points are and think like our customers and design experiences that are better for them. Uh, but then we also need to think about the agent side of it. Our agents are talking to our customers, so so that's huge. But we need to understand the pain points that our agents have, um, look for efficiencies, uh, love, again, what Vafa said about um, about bringing tools and systems together so they're not navigating all, all over the place to, to try and help customers. Um, but certainly where it makes sense, I think um, potentially AI and other systems can, can help simplify the agent experience uh, so they are freed up to, to help our customers. And I see it, you know, it's that two-sided approach where, where we're focused on both the agent and customer experience and ultimately it's gonna be a, a better overall customer experience. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeremy. I appreciate that. And, you know, really great insights in terms of looking at the whole idea about the agent and what pain points they have as well. In many cases, if you help the agent solve, you know, their own pain points, they'll be able to help customers going forward as well. And now the last question that we have is really looking at our question and answer session. And so we'll take a look at some of the questions and answers that have come in. And, and you know, one of the most common ones that I find takes place is just this whole idea about, you know, looking in terms of how can a, you know, how can a contact center director or vice president influence the C-level? Because again, they, you know, the contact center VP or director would be asking for certain resources, either in terms of personnel or technology, and only to get pushback from the CFO or the president or the CEO, CEO of some kind. And so I just want to ask you for your quick opinions on that. And what we'll do is we'll start first with Marty, because we began talking about this a little bit in your segment. Then we'll go to uh, Jeremy and then Vasa as well for the, uh, for the last word on this. And I'll give you two minutes each. Let's try to keep it to two minutes, because you do want to finish on time with this. So uh, Marty, we'll turn things over to you in terms of what your thoughts are in terms of being able to influence the C-suite as a contact center VP or director. Uh, Marty? It, it's going to require collaboration with other leadership in the organization. You know, the majority of reporting and analytics around contact centers is based around agent performance and kind of contact center efficiency. You don't see reporting drilling in on the effects as, as much. So you need to look at other departments, you know, sales, uh, operational sides, and coordinate and find ways to report on the effects that you're having on their side of the organization, the positive pieces. And you have to look for reporting mechanisms that can highlight, you know, some of the things that I talked about earlier, like you know, we started using chatbots, we're escalating from the website, and returns have decreased by 35%, a giant number. But you know, the idea is you have to look at business performance measurements that you can share with the C-level that are directly impacted by the contact center. Okay, great, Marty. Thanks. Those are great points as well, but having that kind of influence. And Jeremy, I'll turn things over to you as well. What are your thoughts on this? So I, I grew up in the contact center and uh, early on in my career, you know, we'd, we'd see, see an issue happen on the front lines that that impacted a lot of customers. And I quickly learned, well, I don't know if I quickly learned it, definitely through the School of Hard Knocks, I learned that those discussions with, with um, C-level execs don't go well when I just say, hey, we're getting a lot of calls about this particular issue. 
um, it gets a whole lot better when we when we're able to uh, pair together some data <laughs> with with some of those insights. We know that there are issues, but we need to figure out how to quantify those. And it, you know, as you move into the director level, it becomes all the more challenging because you're not feeling the pulse of the customer. So it directors definitely need to roll up their sleeves. They need to be talking to their agents, but then they need to also be um, looking through that voice of customer data to be able to quantify those issues uh, to, and, and to what Martin already said uh, to show their impact on some of those bigger, bigger metrics. And business goals. Okay. okay, great, Jeremy. Thank you. I appreciate that as well. And we'll turn things over to Vafa now. And again, the same question about influencing the C-suite. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> Yes, it's one of the most important questions for uh, leaders in the contact center space, right? Um, and I think Marty and Jeremy made some really uh, tremendous points and, and uh, that I agree with. And, and, and I would add the, the following to the points that they've made over it. Um, I think it's very important that you, uh, if you want to influence the C-suite, you need to include the subordinates in those other functions in your journey. So to the extent that you can have a director of finance or a director of operations involved, engaged uh, uh, in your decision-making process, in the work that you're doing, create a cross-functional team so that then the messages from those directors goes up to the CFO's office or the COO's office, the CMO's office, et cetera. Build that very collaborative team-oriented environment and you can have impact at the C-suite. The second is you need to have a very clear understanding on uh, what issues and challenges those leaders in the C-suite have so that you can make your contribution to solving those relevant and pertinent. And then it becomes important because you're helping them solve their problem. And the third, I think this is probably, if not as important, maybe even the most important, is you need to be very clear on the ROI of your work, okay? The, the C-suite, everything that they do and they say is very important. Ultimately, they're measured by the street, particularly if you're in a public environment. Uh, they're influenced by uh, share values and so on and so forth. So you need to be clear on the ROI of your work. Um, so you know, building and some of these points, I think Jeremy and Marty also discussed earlier, which is the, the whole notion of predictive modeling and actually predictive calculators that are accurate. You've, you need to build those kinds of models so that when you say, if I move NPS by 0.5 percentage point, you know, our revenue is going up by 12 percentage point, you need to be able to argue that you need to be able to defend that. Um, or if I change, uh, you know, my resource planning in this way by implementing this tool that I need half a million dollars for, here is the outcome that makes sense for the CFO. So those are the great. three things I would suggest. Okay, great, Buff. Those are great points as well, just to, again, have that kind of influence going forward. So I really want to thank all three of you for answering that question, because I know it's one that's pressing with a lot of directors and, and context interview PEs as well, but how to have that influence outside of their own department. Now, as well, I want to thank everyone for being able to, again, share your thoughts for today. And in terms of a special thank you as well, so I want to thank our panel as well. So, you know, Marty and, and Vafa and Jeremy, thank you very much for all the insight that you shared with all the listeners that are out there. And as well, a special thank you as well to Galena Marcus, who was the producer for this event and helped organize this uh, for Intelligence. I also want to thank Intelligence as well for providing the platform as well as helping to market uh, this event. And also GTAC, the Greater Toronto Area Contact Center Association, for also inviting its members as well. Uh, one little quick plug I'll give is about GTAC. The conference is coming up on, in Toronto on November the 8th, and there's only nine days left to take advantage of the lowest early bird ticket price as well for that particular conference. And also Intelligence is proud to be a silver sponsor for this conference. So we'll have a, a nice little booth with, uh, I guess, uh, some people from already from your team there in Toronto for the conference as well. So we're looking forward to having, uh, having you there. There as well. And I also lastly want to thank as well all the people that are listening at home or, or at the office in terms of this, uh, this webinar or viewing us on your computer screens as well. I hope that you got some really great information from it and also had a chance to go and learn some really key insights about enterprise contact centers both in terms of the second half of this year and for next year and for the future as well. And I should mention that a recording of this webinar, so in case you join later to have a chance to catch all the wonderful key points that were given by our panel, there's also an opportunity for you to hear a recording of the webinar. It'll actually be posted online within roughly 48 hours. And all anybody who signed up for this webinar will actually have the link emailed to you. So you have a chance to actually either re-listen to it yourself 
or catch up on what you missed if you signed in a bit late, or even have a chance to go and share this with your team. And what some people have done in the past is actually, you know, taken the link and actually projected this, say, a manager's meeting and shared it with their other managers and, and co-directors as well for their contact centers. So it's a great way to really help share those insights going forward. So I want to thank everyone that uh, joined today's webinar and as well look forward to seeing both the panel and also uh, all the attendees as well at future events. So thank you very much and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. All right. So thanks, everybody. And we'll just log off at this point in time. Thanks, Mike. Okay. You're welcome, Jeremy.